Welcome to Rebuilding Again, a post-COVID-19 vision for Latinos and healthcare. I'm Gustavo Arellano with the Los Angeles Times, and over the next hour or so, we're gonna be having conversations, interviews, segments, everything regarding how coronavirus has affected Latinos in Southern California, especially all across the United States. Uh, joining me uh, right now, we have some guests in studio. We're gonna have Castro de la Rocha, President and CEO of Altamed Health Services, also with Altamed, Dr. Cheryl Brown, and from UCLA, Go Bruins, I'm also a Bruin myself, Dr. David Hayes Bautista, the Distinguished Professor of Health at UCLA. We're gonna give him formal titles later on in this segment, or in this interview. The coronavirus pandemic has disproportionately hurt Latinos due to their jobs as essential workers and multi-generational living households. In California, Latinos represent 60% of all COVID cases, yet 50% of deaths, even though we only make up 40% of California's population. It's a complete outrage, and yet we don't see enough people being outraged about this. Uh, I thankfully am outraged, and so I started as a columnist for the Los Angeles Times, and my very first column was about a family in Los Angeles that has had to deal with coronavirus, the Gonzaleses of Montebello, and we're gonna see a short segment about what has happened to them because of coronavirus and what's going on with them ever since. We found out that my family uh, had COVID when my dad landed in the hospital July 13th. We suspect that my dad probably got the virus when he would go to warehouses to pick up merchandise for his store, or he might have um, gotten it maybe from a customer. Poncho's Market had been open almost for 30 years. It was my dad's American dream. He worked there seven days a week, nine in the morning till nine o'clock at night. He's only closed um, that store five days. That store was his life. I knew he, my dad was popular within that neighborhood. I just didn't know how popular he was. Somehow they found my number, they found my email. I was getting texts um, because they were really concerned about his health. When uh, my dad landed in the hospital, he went not displaying any symptoms. We initially thought that he was going to the doctor because we thought he had a, a urinary tract infection or an infection of some sort. Then he started displaying the symptoms. His oxygen levels would drop and he started noticing probably within week three that he couldn't go to the bathroom. He told him, I really wanna go, but I can. I really wanna go, but I can't. Oh, you're fine, you just have to eat, you just have to eat. But him having to eat was an extensive amount of exercise for him that couldn't keep oxygen in his lungs, you know? So we would tell him, ask for help. And he's like, nobody helps me. I ask and I tell them I, I wanna eat, but just chewing and putting like a spoon up is just like exhausting, so I can't eat. He started blocking up and it was a massive, massive block that lasted about seven days. They did a procedure to get it out. Then they said, okay, you're better there. One of the doctors ordered an EKG to make sure that my dad's heart hadn't gone through trauma because of everything that he had gone through with his um, intestinal issues. The other doctor that came in decided that my dad didn't need an EKG and ended up canceling. Because they canceled it two days later, my dad's heart rate went up to 270. Again, he went back to the ICU and it took again a couple days for him to stabilize his heart. And it just, it was never ending, never ending. If it wasn't the heart, it was the oxygen. If it wasn't the oxygen, it was intestinal issues. And it was like that for two months. He was in the hospital 54 days and lost 51 pounds. In our case here at home, my mom, my daughter, and myself, we lost our sense of taste and our sense of smell. But it was very minimal. It only lasted from one to three days for each of us. If anything, my mom just had a little shortness of breath, but I would always remind me, you know, you need to drink water. We were drinking lots of tea. And I kind of feel like that's what helped us also get over it because um, I, I just felt like the need for liquids to flush it out was very important. My dad has been doing a lot better within the, what is it already, a month and a half, almost two months that he's been at, been at the skilled nursing facility. Uh, he's improved significantly. He's already gained about 20 pounds 
they're trying to get him off oxygen completely. He's slowly walking. He's going up a couple of steps and his oxygen levels don't drop and his heart rate has stayed stable now. It doesn't go up as it used to anymore. We just want to have him back because it's been so long and obviously we, we missed him. While my dad was in the hospital, my mom did tell my dad, you know what, I think there is nothing else we can really do for Poncho's Market. Time goes by and you have to pay the rent for the space. They've already told us you will not survive COVID again if you get it. It's either your life or Poncho's Market. My dad actually said, you're right, I can't go back. Uh, my life is at risk. And even then, like everything that we had, all the merchandise that we had went bad. Since um, we closed the store, my mom has had to go back to work. It's very heavy labor. It has taken a toll on her. She's very thankful that she has that job though because I mean, it's providing for us to continue paying the mortgage and for my dad to be at that facility as well. And the bills are coming left and right from his uh, 54 day stay at the hospital and, and that's just at the hospital. We still need to wait for the skilled nursing facility. It gives me great pleasure to be with a pioneer in healthcare, Casulo de la Rocha, president and CEO of Altamed Health Services. He reached out to me after reading my column to express his deep concern about Latinos and COVID-19 and to film this special. Since 1977, Casulo has transformed Altamed from a free clinic in East Los Angeles into an influential community health network that services more than 300,000 patients a year. It's all over Southern California. He's also the author of a really great book, The Chicano Boom, Healing California, 1965 through 1985, which is a history of healthcare and Latinos in the state of California. So Castelo, thank you for doing this. It's my pleasure. Thank you, thank you for participating in this. Thank you very much. No, no, yeah. it, it, thank you so much. So you saw this segment, you read my column about the Gonzalez's. What was it about their story that struck you? You know what, what, was, uh, what really struck me, we have a, a serious, a pandemic that has adversely impacted our community in such, a, such an impactful way, if I can use that term. Like you always outrage. Why isn't there an outcry at a national and a state level with regards to this pandemic? We knew from the very beginning of this pandemic, as early as you know, in, in March, April, that this pandemic was gonna adversely impact our community. There was no question in my mind. For all the reasons that you stated at the beginning of this program, the data that you, you cited, we're the essential workers, we're uninsured, we're the highest unemployed in the state of California, uh, and we're the last from the standpoint of, pro, of accessing healthcare services. All those elements added up. So when that happened, we went to work immediately, but we knew at the very beginning that it was going to adversely impact their communities, and in fact, it has. And, and you see in the Gonzalez family such a tragic nexus point of all the different ways Latinos have been affected. They lost their business. They all got sick. They have these health bills. Uh, not stated in the story, but the daughter, she has to you know, go to school at, at, at her home, and also the daughter, she has to teach class, la mama de ellas, and uh -huh. all these different things just destroying, destroying us. And, and the truth of it is we have thousands of stories like this in our communities. And our doctors see this every single day we need to deal with these kind of problems. The tragedy of this thing is that while we understood that this was a pandemic that was gonna impact our communities, when we made the calls to Washington, D.C., when we made the calls to Sacramento, when we made the calls locally to get the help that we needed, to bring the resources that we needed to our community, there was no there to answer the cry. So we went immediately to work. We opened up our clinics. We opened up testing sites. We were the first to get testing sites in Los Angeles and in Orange County, regardless of whether people had insurance or not. We were a valuable, we're a mission-driven organization, and our mission was to open up our doors to our community because the impact that this pandemic was gonna have in our communities. Fortunately, we believe that we helped many, many families through the effort of Altamed and the, the, the employees of our organization, so. 
You know, it's interesting because we're going to hear from Dr. David Hayes Bautista later on, and he famously wrote about the Latino paradox, the health paradox, right. that even though we're so, you know, you see the different <clears throat> factors, we are not supposed to be the healthiest of people, yet we are, but then COVID-19 has just punched us so many times. So what is it about Latinos that we got this disproportionate harm from COVID? Well, there's two things. Uh, on, on the one hand, David is absolutely right in, in, in his own analysis. But I, but I think that uh, on top of some of the challenges that we have, accessing healthcare, being insured, uh, the uninsured, the unemployed, those factors are, are multiples. But think about the fear factor as well. Think about the fear factor. Think about ICE and think about immigration. Think about public charge. Uh, on top of everything else that our families were going through, all these factors contributed the sort of alienation that we see in our community, the, 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 the fact that our communities are isolated and many times do not have access to, to, to health care providers. And that media, the, 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 whether it's, the, it's the, the, the public health systems, the state health care systems, they're not directed at those populations at all. All those compound and make it worse for, for our community. To have Altamed there, the first in terms of testing and making itself up, and we're one small organization in a very large Southern California with Latino populations. While we were there, there should have been multiple Altameds in the community doing what we were doing early on. The ultimate Altamed should have been the government, both the state, local, and federal. Thank you, that's exactly what we're, and by the way, we heard over and over and over free testing, free access to this. Well, that certainly was not the case. Uh, and, and, and we know that from firsthand experience that we saw many people that through our facilities uh, that uh, were concerned about how the heck they're gonna pay for any of the testing that was being done. The book, The Chicano Boom, is a great book. It gives really that history of this influential generation that you were a part Thank of. You. What, the, this, what inspired you to write that? There's two reasons. Number one, some of us in the Chicano boom era back in 1965, we're getting a little older by now. <laughs> nah, so nah, nada de viejito. Gracias, gracias, man. Our ideas are still very fresh, though. <laughs> of course. So the, the, the idea was uh, of sitting down with a, a group of uh, old activists, if I may, those of us that were activists during the, the late 60s, early 70s, in through the, the 80s. We thought that that was an important part of, of history uh, that and we needed to write it. What we did in the healthcare period, during that period of time in healthcare, I think has had a lasting impact in our communities. When you think about those community clinics on a statewide basis, you know, 7.6 million people, 7.6 million people receive care through community clinics. Many of those clinics are run by Latinos, have been and historically run by Latinos. And then there's the physicians, the academicians, there's stories there. But the most important thing from our own perspective is how we were able to do it. Uh, you know, what guided us, what were our models, what motivated, what were the values that were driving us during that, that period of time. When we interviewed the, the 200 plus individuals, there were so many things in common. We were all, most of us were immigrants. Uh, you know, we, we came to this country for a reason. We worked hard. And when we achieved, felt that we had achieved a certain le level of success, we wanted to go back to our communities and help. We built something very important in, 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 in California. We wanted to tell that story. Why? Well, not only did we think it was an important part of our, of our history, but secondly, is for the newer generations. Those generations are the, the group of people that will be our leaders of the future. We want them to understand the struggles that we, uh, that we were involved with and why we were involved in the struggles. And hopefully those values can be passed on from one, one generation to the next generation. Yeah, you read the book, it's like a template to, uh, you know, to tackle COVID-19, to have that concern for the local, the community on a local level, but also push the people above you to say, hey, we're doing it on our own way, con tan poquito que tenemos, right. help us out. Right. Most of us did not have a father who's the CEO of a, a major <laughs> corporation, hospital system, or, or medical group, so 
we learned the hard way. There are important lessons there in terms of politics and the things that are necessary to do uh, to be able to continue to grow the efforts of our community. We had a really, really contentious election. <laughs> uh, Joe Biden, uh, yeah. right before we uh, did this, was announced as a president of the United States. So there was a lot of just, a lot of negativity. What gives, and it, especially with this year, with coronavirus, with a racial reckoning, what gives you optimism? What gives you optimism for the future? Well, number one, uh, that Biden will be president <laughs> of the United States and Harris, of course, uh, I'm, I'm actually delighted at, uh, at that prospect. It's a different track. It's a different road for us with, with the election of Biden. I, I will tell you that I was a little disappointed that Proposition 15 and 16 did not pass. Being a product of affirmative action myself, I back in, in the 60s at the University of California at Santa Barbara and then on to the Berkeley, I, I'm, I was a product of that uh, the affirmative action. I am certain of that. Uh, and so for that to go down was a major disappointment to us. However, with the elections, there are, I believe that there's a, an interesting track here with, with Biden. Number one, Let's tackle COVID-19, a national platform, a national, po national policies, uniform policies across the United States. Let's listen to the scientists. Let's hear what they have to say. And frankly, we're not out of this pandemic by a long shot. There won't be a vaccine here for, for a period of time. And when there is a vaccine, I hope that we're not last uh, to receive that vaccine as we were last on the testing from the state and federal government. My hope is that we would be, as an essential workers, we would be there along with, uh, with communities in need, the essential workers, first to receive access to, to, the, the, to the vaccine. I will also tell you two other things. I, it, on the healthcare side, there's two or three things that, that are terribly important to me. Number one, Obamacare. My hope is that under the new administration, we will see Obamacare on steroids. We would expand it. Uh, my hope is that uh, between uh, our vice president and president that we may get some concessions from the Senate uh, and, and depends obviously uh, their willingness to move forth on some of these issues. With 74 million people voting for the Biden-Harris uh, uh, team, I would hope there would be some sensitivity even at the Senate of, of the United States to, to, to the kind of issues that were important under the Biden uh, Harris uh, campaign. So Obamacare would be one of them. Help for community health centers would be another one that I think would be, be important to us. With Harris as a vice president and as a former prosecutor, the issues around law enforcement and the kind of reforms that we need to see uh, in, in law enforcement hopefully would be moved forward. I'm optimistic about the future here, but I will tell you, with 70, with, well, I'm sorry, close to about 69, 70 million people voting for, for Donald Trump. Uh, it, it, it's the divide that, that exists here, the, the bridge that needs to be built here uh, is an important one, that communications, because uh, like, uh, I'm, I'm gonna quote Van Jones on, on CNN at this point, uh, where he said, look, uh, one of the greatest disappointments is to see that there are 70, almost 70 million people who held to the same views as Donald Trump. And I would have expected that there would have been a greater outcry and a change here. So that means that we have a lot of work ahead of us. There will be challenges. But as we have done it uh, for the last uh, 50 years, uh, Gustavo, uh, we will prevail. Thank you so much, Castelo. My pleasure. We're speaking to Castelo de la Rocha of Alta Med Health, and he's gonna be back with us later on in this program to have a roundtable discussion about the issues we just talked about. Alta Med has over 52 clinics in Southern California providing service to over 300,000 patients. As community spread of COVID-19 continued to spike, federally funded community health centers like Alta Med needed to bolster resources and fast. So soon came drive-through COVID-19 testing, outdoor medical evaluation sites, and personal protective equipment like masks and gowns for patients and also the workers. This is a story of two Altamed patients, Delia Estrada and Justine Limas. Cuando comenzó la pandemia, yo perdí mi trabajo porque en la compañía nos avisaron que iban a cerrar por órdenes del gobierno. Nos avisaron que si cuando hubiera trabajo otra vez, ellos nos iban a contactar. Y si estábamos disponibles, pues podíamos regresar a trabajar. 
tengo varios meses ya sin trabajar. Pues la economía en mi casa no, no es buena. Um, también en, en el mes de mayo, um, tengo una hija. que tuvo un accidente de carro. Eh, no sabía si iba a vivir o no. Gracias a Dios, está ahorita en rehabilitación. Yo pues estoy al lado de ella ahorita también, por la razón también por la cual no he buscado ahorita trabajo, porque pues estoy al pendiente de ella, de sus necesidades. Porque los doctores pues me dijeron que no podía estar... Tenía que estar alguien con ella las 24 horas del día. Ahorita tiene que andar en, en, clini, en la clínica, en su rehabilitación, en sus terapias, citas de doctor. Como todos sus golpes fueron en la cabeza, ella, su mente no está igual que antes. Eh, hay cosas que recuerda, cosas que no. Y pues eso va, va a ser su terapia. Más que nada, volver a trabajar, a ver qué tanto su memoria puede volver a activarse otra vez. Conozco a Mariana, tengo tiempo de conocerla, que trabaja aquí en Alta Med. Ella un día me llamó y me dijo que el programa que hay aquí, y me dijo que ya había metido como es una aplicación algo así, ¿verdad? Y um, ella me dio la noticia de que había calificado y ella me explicó que son las personas que trabajan aquí, que ayudan. Y Alta Med me ayudó económicamente para darle de comer a mis hijos porque yo estaba sin trabajo. Yo ahorita, cuando por algo puedo so, ir a limpiar una casa, o lo que sea, para traer algo de dinero, porque yo no tengo, ahorita no tengo. COVID ha afectado me en so many áreas, um, homelessness, uh, food shortage, diaper shortage, um, school supply shortage, um, kind of lacking on hours of work and taking care of my grandparents. Taking care of my two little ones. <laughs> my son's five years old, he's autistic. Um, it's really hard finding diapers. They either give you less diapers for more money and it's really hard for his size because he's a bigger size. He's, he's a size in adults and it's, it's hard. In the beginning, we were close to being homeless because I couldn't pay the rent for two months. Had to go to my grandma's, to my aunt's, to my cousin's. Then I went to a few friends' house and it was kind of hard with two kids and a single parent. Signing up for a homeless shelter was kind of hard because since they have rules and guidelines, I couldn't follow them because my son, since he's autistic, he's loud, um, he's noisy, he, and then it's usually during the time where it's nighttime. Right now I'm living with a friend. COVID has affected my kids' schooling because I have to go to different places. The landlord doesn't want to pay for internet, so by me trying to find places for free Wi-Fi for my kids, we can't always go inside. We have to be outside in the car, sitting down doing um, you know, assignments or Zoom meetings, it's, it's hard. I've had a relationship with Altima for before my kids were born, so I would say more than 13 years. I asked Altima to help me out with this first time. They did, they helped me out with diapers, they helped me with food, they helped me with paying some of the bills, clothes on my kids, and I thank them for that. Just take it day by day, to be honest with you, I can't really do much about it you know I take care of both of my gra grandmas on both sides um, I take care of my kids um, I can only do so much to help meet unprecedented demands for health screenings and other medical services related to the coronavirus Altamed had to pivot fast not just to provide testing to its thousands of patients, but also the community at large, as well as ensure the safety of staff with PPE and just also just their own mental health. Here to talk about that is Dr. Cheryl Brown, Medical Director, Infection Prevention for Altamed Health Services. And doctor, one of the things that strikes me about this package that we saw was just the charity involved to, uh, you know, to your patients, to your clients. Most, most healthcare providers, you're lucky if you get a smile out of them. Why is it important as a doctor for uh, the medical profession to be able to give that sort of help outside of just their health? Yeah, well, one of the, the main challenges as a, as a provider, as a physician, is 
that we're not able to help patients outside of the office. We see them, we're able to prescribe them medications, we're able to give them some guidance during the 15 or 20 minutes that we have with them, uh, but as a provider, we feel a little helpless as far as helping them outside of the office. And so working at Ultimate is, is, a, is a really great job because we have so many different services that are able to really reach out to patients and really help them in the, in the community with what they need, just like you, you saw here, helping with financial, you know, financial help, helping with um, other services that they can get throughout the community. So it's great, um, a great service that we're able to provide. It's really remarkable. We're in a pandemic. They say it's a once in a generation. Really, this is once every couple of hundred years, the type of thing that you only read about in books. Right. So how do you feel that Altamed was prepared for this or how were you unprepared for this? Yeah. Well, I don't think that anyone can really be truly prepared yeah. for a pandemic like this. Uh, we were fortunate that we already had an infection prevention program established at Altamed well before the pandemic. Uh, so we were able to hit the ground running, uh, knowing all of the different aspects for uh, a safe and protective environment to prevent the spread of COVID throughout our, our organization. We started a COVID-19 task force to look at all of the different elements that we needed to do to be compliant with all of the policies and procedures from the CDC, from local public health, to reassure our staff that it was safe at Ultima to come back to work and to also reassure our patients that they could come in. So, you know, we weren't completely prepared, but I think that we were more prepared than most. And it's been an honor to work with everyone at Altamed. And given that safety concern, you know, it's not like the world just stopped for coronavirus. People still had to go in for check-ins. People right. still had other health problems. People still wanted to also just be healthy. So what did Altamed do to reassure, not just reassure those patients, you're going to be completely yeah. safe away from coronavirus, but also to be able to execute uh, any health uh, issues or concerns that you folks had to deal with? Yeah. Well, one of the biggest challenges when the pandemic hit was we had a decrease actually in the number of patients that were coming in to access care. Uh, preventative visits, well visits, newborn visits, vaccines, cancer screening, patients were putting it off because they couldn't access care either from transportation, they were still in essential um, jobs that they couldn't take time off work to access healthcare, or they were afraid to access healthcare. So we were able to start a telehealth program where we could provide telephone visits and video visits for our patients so that for those that couldn't access care in person with us, we were still able to provide uh, care to them, you know, in a, via a uh, virtual environment so that they could still access the care that they needed. Yeah, I see those commercials on Channel 9, like, oh, wow, yeah, they're doing the, like, innovations that mm -hmm. way. And why is that important? Like, are you seeing that more happen or do you see still that people don't get the program in regards to what Altamed is doing to combat this? Well, it has been difficult. You know, communication is always a, a difficulty, really getting our message out. So we've tried to be as creative as possible to um, let our patients and the community know what type of healthcare services we're still providing for them. We actually never shut our doors in our primary care clinics. We've continued to provide care, um, but we've had to get creative in getting the message out so that patients continue to come in and access care, either via our telehealth platform or coming in face to face. Well, what are some other interventions that the public health or you know health institutions can do to specifically help out the Latino community for coronavirus? Well, you know, one of the big challenges for our patients is that they don't have paid time off. They can't take time off to come to our normal visits, not during a pandemic. Um, but if we tell them that they've been exposed, if, you know, they, they let us know they've been exposed to someone with COVID-19 and we give them recommendations to quarantine at home or quarantine for 14 days away from everybody else, um, they've had difficulty doing that. They don't have um, paid time off to be able to stay home, or they have many fa family members that are living in their house that they can't actually isolate away from them. So providing additional services, um, providing guaranteed paid time off, providing um, sick leave, making sure that people still have resources coming in if they have to quarantine or isolate, and then also providing it, places for them to go if they can't isolate themselves in their home away from others providing hotel support or other lodging support so that they can 
be quarantined or isolate um, so that they don't continue to spread COVID-19 to their family members or other community members. Among the iconic images that we have so far of this pandemic are folks like yourself, doctors, nurses, anyone at these clinics fatigued with, with, uh, with scratches from wearing these masks. How are you ensuring your own, not even safety, but health, your mental health and that of your fellow colleagues? What, are you, what is Altamed doing to make sure that all of your doctors and nurses are on point and also, you know, frankly, being good during this pandemic? Yeah, well, like I said, communication has been key to this pandemic, both for our patients, but also for our staff members. We have regular huddles with them. We have regular, um, almost like a podcast, um, almost every morning where we talk to all of the staff members to encourage them to keep going, um, making sure that they continue to stay safe while at work, doing their physical distancing, making sure that they're wearing their masks. Um, we respond to a lot of questions if they do have any trouble wearing their personal protective equipment, making sure that they have ever, all the instructions so that they're wearing it appropriately and they're not suffering some of the complications like you, like you mentioned, giving them tips and tricks so that they can continue to work and be safe. What are some of the lessons you think that the rest of the uh, healthcare community can take from what Altamed have done to combat coronavirus? Well, you know, one of the biggest things that I think um, really helped us in the beginning is that we were very uh, nimble, agile, we were very creative, and we were thinking outside the box. We weren't, um, you know, Make, we, we had to act quickly, right? So I think that that is something that other organizations can learn from us. It's just how nimble and agile and creative we were to really just uh, move forward. Like Costello said, uh, we knew that there was a need in the community and then we just went for it. We didn't really ask questions. We just went and we took care of the community and that was the most important thing. What do you see for the future of Latinos in Southern California? How do, I mean, this is the whole point of this program, but what are we gonna do? Like, what is the way forward for us? Yeah, well, I, I mean, that's a really good question. <laughs> that's a really good question. I think that we're gonna have a lot of challenges. It's not just the physical illness that is impacting the Latino community. It's homelessness, joblessness, food insecurity, you name it, um, mental health, everything is impacting this community. So uh, making sure that we have resources to um, help with each one of those social determinants of health, not just helping them with their COVID illness itself, but also looking at all of the ramifications. And holistic. Making sure, mm -hmm, a holistic approach, exactly. I'm really worried about our, our students and making sure that they're not held back because of this and really putting a lot of effort into tutoring and childcare services as well is gonna be really important moving forward. But you have hope. I do, I always have hope. <laughs> that's th that's yes. good to hear from doctors. Thank yes. you so much, Dr. Brown. Thank you. As a lock, thank you. Uh, as a lockdown forced us to stay home and schools to remain closed, families are struggling to meet basic needs such as paying for rent and food. 83% of Latino parents also said that they are concerned about their children falling behind. We were just talking about students, about their children falling behind in school due to a range of factors. And one of the big ones you would think you wouldn't have in this day and age, but we do, unreliable internet access at home. We're now gonna hear from Carolina Briones. She's a junior, a journalism major and a junior at Long Beach State. When the COVID pandemic began, um, I actually was already online because I was transitioning from going to one university to another one. Um, I was in the middle of transferring as a transfer student. Just, it, it was really odd just because my professors were sending us emails and stating that our syllabus was gonna change and that our, you know, what we would normally be doing wouldn't be possible because of um, the pandemic and how their classes that were in person had to change so that their schedule was now changing and so it would affect us as well. It was very uncertain in the beginning, definitely as a student, um, a lot of questions of, you know, whether we're going to continue um, for the next semester, what's going to happen, how am I going to transfer to this next school. When you think about your junior and senior year in college, it's definitely the time to start planning ahead for your career. This is definitely the more where you get into your major and as I look back a year ago, I was looking at internships and I was looking at opportunities that were only available to junior and seniors. And now, as I look at those same internship opportunities, they're not available or they have been delayed because of COVID. You know, I know we just got 
an email several weeks ago that we're going to continue to be online for the next semester. Um, just having a little more in advance of getting to know like what's going to happen, what's going on, just so we can plan ahead and know, okay, this is what I should be looking forward to in the next couple months school-wise. We know that our professors are doing their absolute best um, to work with us and make sure that we have all the proper you know, tools to get us through you know, college and just school in general and to really just take every day one day at a time. The way it differs from older generations, Gen X and Millennials, is because they're more settled in to you know, their careers and you know, their lives and we're just now is trying to figure it out. We're trying to maneuver not only through being adults, but also a pandemic. So it's it's a it's a little it's it's a little difficult. With me now is Dr. David Hayes Bautista. He has long title, but an important title. He's a distinguished professor of medicine and director of the Center for the Study of Latino Health and Culture at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. And he's also, also the author of many books, also co-author of The Chicano Boom. So, Profe, nice to have you. Pleasure to be here. You heard her, uh, Carolina's story. I'm sure you're hearing the exact same story from your students and just other folks. Absolutely. And I think what we need to remember is that what they're doing right now is so important, not only as we rebuild California, actually, we have been rebuilding California eight times as Latinos in the past 250 years. We're very resilient. <laughs> so, you know, Echenos lo que, pero we can do it. So it's difficult. We have issues with Wi-Fi, but there is a huge heft in the Latino community that is powering this state, is powering this country through the COVID pandemic in spite of all the shortness of access and funds and funding, we are doing it. What is the importance of students right now, the student experience in COVID? Well, the student experience is really important because while I, I hear some people talk about, oh, Latinos, they're not very well educated. I even heard someone say, half Latinos don't graduate from high school. That is so 1970. 90% <laughs> of Latinos in the country graduate from high school. 70% go on to college. So things have changed. So this is uh, how they get this important human capital that Latinos will provide to this country, to this country's GDP to move off into the future. And right now things are difficult. So we need to figure out how do we increase the ability of Latinos to connect in, get broadband, so they continue doing these studies. We might be doing this lockdown for a number of months more. We cannot afford to lose one day of education, much less a year. Well, what do you, what do you see happening with students? How are they gonna be changed because of all this distance learning, because of the fact that they are not going, especially in the elementary school levels, they're not interacting with their fellow friends or going through all those, you know, I guess social, the social learning as opposed to just the academic learning. Well, there, there's two pieces to that for sure, and one is the social piece, and for better or for worse, I think it's for better. Latinos, we do have bigger households. We have more people per household. We have more wage earners per household. We have more children per household. So at least they're getting that social ability inside the household. Now the issue comes with what are they being taught? How is that getting through to them? How are parents able to reinforce the lesson, particularly if the parents have got to work? So we're putting some additional um, weight in the saddle for these kids. But you know what? I'm pretty sure they're going to make it. We've been through worse before, so we're going to do it again. <laughs> Has, how have you seen the educational institutions, both public and private, react to the, you know, their job, which is to teach our children and make sure that they are, their educational attainment doesn't go any lower? Well, this shut down very quickly here in the state of California, middle of March. In fact, I was right in the middle of a lecture when suddenly all the students pulled out their uh, cell phones and buzz, and there was a buzz and suddenly half of them stood up and I said, what's going on? They just closed the campus, we're supposed to leave. Oh my Lord. I was talking so I didn't notice that. <laughs> um, and I'll have to say this state faltered initially and it's still faltering as usual. The wealthier areas, they don't only have broadband, better access, they, parents can afford tutors. They got access to the testing much earlier. Meanwhile, over the east side of LA County, uh, the Wi-Fi is not so good. There's a real physician shortage. Uh, and we didn't start the testing until way later. We didn't start the protective equipment until way later. So we just keep putting weight in the saddle for Latino families. But Latino families are extremely resilient. What, what could they have done differently? Well, to begin with, everyone should have a plan. For example, the Obama administration left a plan for what to do in case of a pandemic. <laughs> so there's a plan there. 
They didn't bother to read it. In fact, I understood it was even thrown away. Uh, so we have to have these plans. And I keep telling people, what should we learn from this pandemic, this epidemic? Simple. There will be another epidemic, if not pandemic, in five to seven years. Remember H1N1, Ebola, all those other SARS? Hello, we forget. There will be another one. We need to be better prepared. And what we have seen is that the most important segment of essential workers, the farm workers, the grocery store workers, the packing house workers, construction, etc., were totally left out of whatever plan we had. So it was, we had a good plan for West LA. Those uh, areas can afford to take their laptop to home, work from home. You cannot plant strawberries in your living room. Without those strawberries, we do not eat. <laughs> it's all about those inequities, and we still have to tackle those inequities. Yes, we're resilient. I totally agree with that. But that resilience, it cansa uno after a while, you know. So what's the advice that you would give to students right now as they go through something that, they'll, you know, that they've never even imagined in their life? Well, actually, we can turn that around, particularly high school age kids, uh, first couple of years of college. That's when you're really independent. You don't like to be told what to do. You want to get rid of those rules. I'm, a, I'm my own person. This is now the time to use that mm. because you have to learn how to navigate online, how to take the initiative. Rather than waiting for a teacher to say, do this, think, you know, how could I learn from this? We can learn a lot of lessons from this pandemic. We can come out of this stronger, smarter, and more ready for the next one. And what about parents? Parents who have to deal with their students, not just learning at home, I'm sure that's not too much of an inconvenience for them, but the inconvenience of their children being left behind by these institu educational institutions. That again is where uh, one of the things we learned from parents, luckily the parents were pretty smart about this. Uh, we had a big wave of immigration during the late 20th century with folks that came from Mexico, about nine years of education. So they wanted their kids to go to school. Often that's why they immigrated. But what the parents, because they had never been to college, they really couldn't help their students once they got into college. But man, they can give them ganas, they can give them support, they can give them food, all sorts of things. The other student groups don't get so much. So it's, you know, you win some, you lose some. There are some strengths, there are some weaknesses. Let's build on the strengths and then shore up the weaknesses. You're obviously at UCLA and you're teaching, you're helping to teach that next generation of Latino medical professions. I know you host a podcast and you had actually two first year Latino medical students. What were the stories that they told you about what, what they're seeing right now? Well, this was really interesting. Uh, in fact, they had both been volunteers in, in my office, my center at UCLA. And of course, they're starting medical school, and one of them couldn't have a white coat ceremony because you can't have large crowds. And it's usually like the crowning moment. You start medical school, you get this white coat. Uh, another student going to a different school, actually, they sent the white coat to their home, mm. and her parents put on her white oh, coat wow. to start. So, it, you know, you can really lean into this and grow from it, or you can get surprised by it and make a shambles out of things. So these two students are now uh, taking some courses online, some things, you know, laboratory, you simply have got to be there. Uh, our son-in-law is a third year medical student, UC Davis, he just started his clinicals. Uh, so it's, it's a new learning environment all the way around. But the whole point is not to get frozen by it, don't let it stop you, but learn from it and grow. Learn from the past, historian. What, what moments from the past do you think would be, como se dice, instructive for how we can tackle coronavirus today? Well, uh, more than just coronavirus, so let's tackle the political environment that allowed this coronavirus. We had it almost under control, and then the political environment said, ah, liberate yourselves. <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, like I say, for the eighth time, Latinos have got to step up and build the state. We've had to do it about every 30 years, usually after we have had a Trump-like administration called nativists, nativism. They're always trying to throw the Chinese out of California, take the vote away from indigenous, not allow African Americans to move into the state of California. And the thing about nativist uh, elections is they can win elections big. Trouble is, and I've seen this, now this is the eighth time, they can't govern. They can't get the streets paved, they can't collect the garbage, and they usually fail very quickly because they can't govern. That's when then Latinos step back up, we lean into it, and we pave the streets and we pick up the garbage, grumbling perhaps, uh, and sometimes we're the target of those nativist movements but we're always there when this country needs us. This regeneration reminds me of like the Aztec idea of the quinto sol, sexto sol. So we're at the sixth sun right now. Eighth sun for California. <laughs> we had to do this eight times, build this country up. And finally, what, as a professor, how's it been for you to be teaching students during this pandemic? Well, actually, I'm not teaching yet until the winter quarter. We research. 
So as soon as we shut down and I started hearing these ugly stereotypes about Latinos and COVID, you know, we're lazy, we're getting all the Medi-Cal, et cetera. I said to our staff, you know what? We need to get data out and we have never been busier. We've now done 10 COVID and Latinos reports to really actually give some data about what is really going on? What do Latinos add in? Why is COVID hitting Latinos so hard if we're so healthy? And it has to do with, uh, we're healthy on chronic diseases, heart cancer and stroke that are lifestyle diseases, how we live, how we eat, whom we associate with. But communicable diseases are different. Mm. So I can breathe on you, Gustavo, and I'm not gonna give you a heart attack. I can breathe on you and give you COVID. Now, normally with communicable diseases like tuberculosis, Latinos have higher rates of tuberculosis. You don't die of them, but this is a new one and you can die of it. So it's a communicable disease and it starts to illustrate just how disconnected Latinos have been from the medical care system. We have a huge shortage of Latino physicians. It'll take 500 years to make up the shortage we have today if the California schools keep graduating Latino physicians at the rate that they do. We still have high rates of uninsurance well, if we can take care of it with, you know, caldo de pollo or something with family, like heart, cancer, stroke, okay, this is communicable. It is different. It is a color. And we were left out in the cold when it began. Thank you so much, Dr. David Hayes Bautista. My pleasure. Six on the caldo de pollo. Now, this is a great interview of all of them, of course. More than six in ten, and speaking of food, actually, more than six in ten of adults in Latino households reported either job losses, furloughs, or reductions in their wages and work hours. Among Latino houses with job or wage losses, almost nine in ten adults reported having serious financial problems. Small businesses especially were not spared by COVID-19. I would know because my wife runs a small market in Santana. It's been so hard for her that I'm now a cashier at this store. I'm not good with money. We now hear from Vicente Ortiz, chef and owner of Don Chentes in various cities, including Bell, Carson, Pico Rivera, Huntington Park, and also Bell Gardens. Don Chente Bar and Grill nace aproximadamente en 1996 con un concepto primario que fue Tacos Don Chente. Cuando empezó la pandemia, obviamente nos vimos muy impactados porque tuvimos que cerrar de un día al otro, que nos avisaron que ya no podríamos estar abiertos. Y fue difícil, de cinco restaurantes cerré tres, otros dos solamente estuvimos vendiendo comida para llevar, para mantenerlos abiertos. Cuando nos dijeron que teníamos que cerrar los restaurantes, platicamos varios restauranteros y chefs, amigos míos, y llegamos a la conclusión que la mercancía se nos podía echar a perder, que mejor era hacer pues, entrega de comida, no solamente comida caliente, sino comida también con, como despensas. Después, cuando se nos acabó la mercancía que teníamos, Muchos amigos, eh, proveedores, nos hablaron para decirnos que, que ellos te, querían cooperar también. Y así fue como continuamos varios meses entregando despensas y comida caliente pues, a la gente más necesitada. Y el primer día que nos dijeron, ok, pueden abrir, pero no en su totalidad, fue de mucha alegría, ya que empezamos a llamar a los empleados que habíamos descansado. Y bueno, ahí empezó nuevamente a moverse la economía en los restaurantes. Después de aquella gran alegría de que ya íbamos a regresar, pues nuevamente nos dicen, tienen que cerrar. Otra vez a la misma batalla, a descansar a los empleados. Pero ahí ya teníamos un poco más de experiencia de manejar la situación. Cuando ya nos dieron luz verde para reabrir nuevamente, pues nosotros empezamos a mover las redes sociales de los restaurantes y también en las redes sociales personales y de los empleados para poderle llegar a más clientes. De esa manera, aunado a que invertimos en los patios, hacer una, un lugar agradable, claro, ya con los permisos que teníamos del Departamento de Salud y con el permiso que teníamos también de ABC de poder servir alcohol en los patios fuera de lo que es el edificio del restaurante, pues eso nos ayudó mucho a mover realmente pues, la economía de los restaurantes y así poder con, recontratar a los empleados que habíamos descansado. La gente debe de saber que el funcionamiento de un restaurante tiene muchas inspecciones, tanto de ABC, quien es quien se encarga de las licencias de alcohol, como el Departamento de Salud y también inspectores de la ciudad. Creo que uno de los lugares más seguros que pueden comer es en un restaurante bien establecido, porque aparte nosotros eh, tenemos una máquina que lava los platos a 160 grados, 
aparte pone un líquido que es un sanitizer o un desinfectador que mata cualquier bacteria, cualquier virus. Yo pertenezco a diferentes organizaciones. Una es Fuerza Migrante, que es a nivel nacional. Otra de las organizaciones es Movimiento Migrante, que nosotros vemos de qué manera podemos apoyar a México cuando ha habido desgracias. Y la otra es AJUA, que es Asociación de Jaliscienses Unidos en Acción, que hace redes empresariales entre jaliscienses y californianos. Esto me recuerda a mi hermano Manuel. Siempre él decía, todo pasará. Esto va a pasar y vamos a tener que regresar a una normalidad si Dios lo quiere y nos lo permite. Yo creo que tenemos que ser positivos, tenemos que reinventarnos. No debemos de ver todo lo negativo, sino en algún momento tenemos que ver qué, pues, qué algo de positivo me está dejando esta pandemia. Thank you all for those of you at home for watching this special. Uh, great interviews, important subjects and conversations. Please do spread this around, share it with your families and friends, and watch it again. Uh, next, we're going to have a roundtable about, about the topic at hand, the post-COVID vision for Latinos and healthcare. So joining me back is Castulo Ro de la Rocha of, of La Alta Med and Dr. David Hayes Bautista from UCLA. And joining me on Skype is another UCLA folk, uh, Diana Bonta. She's an adjunct professor at UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. And her career has been in the fields of public health administration and at nonprofit agencies. Hola, Diana. Hola. Hola, good to be here. And also joining us via Skype is Joel Garcia. He's a primary interviewer and direct oral history data gatherer for the Chicano Health Movement Legacy Project. Hola, Joel. Hola, ¿cómo está? Bien, bien, gracias. So, Diana, you've seen all these stories. You know, of course, all, the, your, all these stories that you've read. Do you think the public at large knows enough about these stories? You know, it was an honor and privilege to work on Chicano Boom because of the fact that I was able to hear these stories directly from comadres and compadres Uh, they grew up in rural areas, in urban areas. They had families that were janitors, seamstress, farm workers, and they developed this incredible resilience, fortitude, strength that they got from their ancestors and were able to make changes throughout their careers. So, no, I don't think that everyone truly appreciates the kinds of rich history that we have and because the book was published through the auspices of uh, David Hayes Bautista and Altamed with Castro de la Rocha, we were able to have this history be uh, given to future generations and particularly the oral history because the archives at UCLA have the actual voices of the people responding to interviews. So Joel and I had the privilege of actually going out and interviewing people. And what is the impact of stories, both from the past, but also from the coronavirus uh, pandemic that we have right now? What is the impact of those stories to people who maybe have never heard those stories before? You know, I think that um, we begin to understand through the stories our different fields, such as public health, the fact that um, right now public health is not allowed to do the job that it needs to do in communicating with the public, in establishing trust and establishing honesty with the public and clarity and having science dominate our decision making. So learning about the history of public health through people who have experienced what happens in the best of times through true leadership will help provide a pathway for us as we're dealing with COVID in the years to come. I, I was privileged to work in the city of Long Beach in the health department for the state of California, and then to be an advisor on the CDC advisory committee for over eight years. And I got to see this public health workforce that was exceptional, exceptional and they've been pushed to the sidelines and it makes me angry and upset that their voices have been silenced. 
So I think that we're going to be seeing a tremendous change with this election and the ability of us to move forward in a very positive fashion to deal with whatever comes our way. Joel, you have been devoting most of, uh, so much of your career to documenting these stories. What is, uh, wh what's your advice for the people out there who are watching the importance of documenting those stories that they're going through right now through, of coronavirus for future generations? The answer, I think, is in raising consciousness of the extent of the problem and the nature of the problem that we're facing and uh, the means by which we are trying to get information out, such as through this program. And uh, I think Dr. David Hayes Bautista has begun also a series of uh, podcasts that uh, give you the details, the statistics that are necessary for people to understand that this is a very serious problem. And it, uh, we know there are, were inequities, but now the inequities are playing out in a way that uh, has never been seen. So uh, to view this as a, I would say healthcare for me as a professor of health policy and law has always been about uh, human rights and health is a human right. And within that also there's the civil rights aspect. But the uh, general uh, view uh, of this is that it's either uh, hidden with other statistics or it doesn't exist. Well, it does exist and exists in a very bad way. And uh, unfortunately, we know that almost a quarter of a million people have died. And how many uh, Latinos, Latinas uh, are among that? Uh, the disproportion is not totally, the pandemic is what it is, it affects everybody. But it affects our community differently than others. And uh, how that is, I I, um, I don't fully understand, but I know our epidemiologists are dealing with that. Our researchers are dealing with that. Our policymakers are dealing with that. And we have to keep impressing on the policymakers that they have to have uh, a principled, ethical uh, policy and planning approach for us to be part of that. And for the uh, advice to the future generations uh, that would be looking, hopefully looking back, this somehow was uh, resolved. We don't know when and how, but we would hope that, that it never happens again. It never happens in, in, in such an uh, unequal way, inequitable way. Uh, we also are going to be seeing this play out uh, when there is a vaccine. Who is the who is going to be in line and who is going to not be in line and when are they going to for that. So the upcoming planning and that it be based on science, that be uh, well informed, that the organizations that promote our human rights, our civil rights, uh, there are, there are uh, organizations, there are gatherings of people that have done that. Uh, the Latino caucus here at the state legislature, I'm sure is very sensitive. Uh, we have an attorney general's office, uh, Javier Becerra, for example, uh, is very tuned in and is arguing for our rights under the uh, Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. So being able to keep the things that provide us relief are very important, but that's not enough. We have to think way beyond that. We have to use every means at our disposal. And I think uh, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus is also very aware and community health centers that are on the front line that I'm the most associated with uh, all over the state, all over the U.S. actually, the uh, one that here is most notable and present and is doing this rebuilding uh, program, helping move this along, is Ultimate Health Center. So we have to keep the closest to us informed and the other people that uh, have to inform the scientists. And then we uh, are... Future generations have to work with implementing that and always being in the forefront so we're not excluded. Uh, Dr. Hayes Bautista and Castulo, what are the importance of people sharing their stories right now and documenting those stories? Well, I think as I mentioned just a bit ago, I think there's a, a rich history there. Uh, a history of a community that, uh, you know, 50 years ago, uh, that for all intents and purposes was not present and absent 
in California and nationally. So over the course of that 50 years, we are a, a population of significance today. What has happened in California in those 50 years, just think about the politics in California. Think about today Arizona. Think about today New Mexico. Think about so many other states where Latinos have been influential in elections, for example. That is a basic constitutional right that all of us have. All of us begin there. This was not about overturning the government or anything 50 years ago. It was being part of the solution as being incorporated into a solution. So over that course of 50 years, through the politics, through the struggles that we've had in higher education, uh, in, in, in elections, in gerrymandering and the sort, we've learned our lessons. We have created something important in California. My hope is that the new generations and younger generations will learn from what we built over the course of many years. We leave what I believe is an important legacy here uh, that, that it has been driven primarily by a passion to do good in our communities, to not forget our communities, to go back into our communities and empower those communities to continue to move forward. Know your history, kids, know your history. <laughs> Going forth, what are our expectations, Dr. Hayes Bautista? Well, one of the things that we need to do is in fact create our own narrative because in this country's history, and by the way, we have been part of what's now this country since 1521, 500 years, we are not in the narrative exactly. of this country. And rather than us being able to explain to others who are we, what's our narrative, we have been told who we are, what we're like, and it has not been positive. Let me tell you, for 170 years here in California, it has never been a positive narrative about Latinos. We need to find our voice, create our own narrative, and project it, and it comes out of all these stories. Mm -hmm. 60 million stories right now in the United States, 60 million Latinos. No two people are Latino exactly the same way, but together our narrative will help lead this country into the future because we have been an integral part. We just got wiped out. We need to reinsert ourselves. Exactly. Uh, Dr. Bonta, what does a re-election, uh, or you know, the election, not re-election, where am I thinking? What, is, what does the election of Donald, of Donald Trump, do you, you can see how traumado I am, folks, from these past four years. What does the election of Joe Biden represent for the issue of Latinos and coronavirus? <laughs> I think it makes a big difference because, as I mentioned previously, we have seen the silencing of public health leadership voices. And so it's going to be extremely important to hear with clarity for the American public to understand what steps do they need to take collectively for us to be able to lead through this epidemic and to prepare for the future. We don't know what else is going to hit us in the, in the near future. So. It's, I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic through this election, tremendously optimistic. And uh, how, how do you feel, Joel? What, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, well, as you know, I have, to, I have to have a smile because we needed some relief in the, in the picture that has been so dismal and full of atrocities uh, over the recent past. Uh, I believe that both uh, Biden and Kamala, Kamala, I gotta say, right? Come on, so she's from Oakland. <laughs> Oakland also, my, my children were born there. So uh, we have a chance uh, to be heard. We have, which I don't think we have had before. As a matter of fact, we, it isn't that we weren't being even heard, but that we were put at the lowest end of the, the social spectrum uh, in terms of any area. Uh, and that's unfortunate. I don't think we'll have that. So with their election, the hope uh, that goes along with that is very important. But then hope by itself is just a motivator. There has to be the science. There has to be the people who are knowledgeable that actually uh, devise the plans, uh, promote the policies. And like I said, I'm a professor of health policy and law. So I believe that having principled uh, and having uh, the best policies that are, that are passionate are necessary. Uh, I think Kamala Harris, uh, in, the, in her statements, and I think that they would go to the president-elect also, uh, has advocated strongly for everybody 
including the undocumented and uh, people uh, who have migrated, as she did being first generation. She understands the dilemmas that we are in and have been in. And whether we're first generation or we've been here many generations or, or immig direct immigrants, we'll not be excluded. Uh, I think that's what uh, I would see in the Biden-Harris administration to come after we uh, see the roadblocks that are impeding that cleared out, that we'll have something that's more rational. Uh, it does not mean necessarily that it's a, uh, a road that will be uh, without its um, many, um, I don't know, just blocks along the way. Uh, uh, but they will overcome those. I, I believe they will. How do you feel about the election? Uh, what, what, does, what do you think the Biden administration will bring to tackle this coronavirus problem? You know, besides the fact he'll actually believe the scientists and the doctors. Doctor, why don't you go ahead and <laughs> okay. come back to it right now? Well, we have actually has seen this period. Uh, every 20 years, ever since 1855, California just had become a state. And by the way, thanks to Latinos, California continued Mexico's abolition of slavery gave non-whites the, the vote, gave women rights, and by the way, it came as a bilingual state. They were built up a reaction, and we had the uh, American Know Nothing Party. 20 years later, Dennis Kearney kicking the Chinese out, taking the vote away from Indians, getting rid of bilingualism. Every 20 years, we have these nativists get elected because they're always afraid of us, the foreigner, us, the other, even though we've been here for 500 years. So we need to understand this is a typical pattern. We saw it here in California with 187 and we're seeing it now at the national level. So it's a matter of raising our voices in terms of politics. When people ask me, what can we do about COVID? What can we do about the Trump administration? I say, if you can, register and then vote. And if for some reason you can't register, find someone who can't, who hasn't, and get them animated to register and vote. Outside of the, of the federal level, I'm actually interested because you talked earlier about how there were disappointments at the ballot box here in California with some of the propositions. So what do you hope that both our state administrator politicians and local politicians, the lessons that they learn from this? And what can we do to continue to push them to make sure that they serve us? But one of the, from my own standpoint, a priority uh, that our state government uh, has to uh, major undertaking would be to, to take the lessons learned through this pandemic. What, what, what was wrong? What, what was done incorrectly? What can be corrected on a going forth basis? There's no question in my mind that community-based organizations like Altamed Health Services, and there are many of us across the, the, the state of California, we've been working in Latino communities for 50 years. We're not alone. There are many organizations up and down the state of California that have been working day in and day out in community, in Latino communities. We have the trust of the community. We're there every day. So that when you wanna do testing, you don't go to a Fortune 500 company and get them to do testing in Latino communities. That's absurd. When you have a network of providers up and down, that's a basic lesson, yeah. a basic, basic lesson that you go to those people that are working in the community. Resources are always helpful. Issues around manpower, for example. Doctors in, in our community graduating. Proposition 16 did not pass. Why was that important? Well, because Proposition 16 was what got some of us into the law schools and got us into the medical schools uh, and ultimately graduated. Since Proposition uh, rather, 209 was an act that we've seen a decrease in the number of Latinos being admitted into the matter. We need to change those policies now uh, and so that the future we have access to bilingual, bicultural physicians. It's the right thing to do for California. It's the right thing to do nationally. There are many other lessons that we learned from this pandemic, but I'll tell you one of the most important ones, Gustavo. The reason why we wrote this book, what we did as part of this Chicano boom, we did this on our own. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of help from, from other sources coming in. We did it on our own. We were in confrontational politics. And I'm not sure we're way beyond confrontational politics at this <laughs> point, right? We did it on our own. And we need to do it on our own again. We need to rebuild again. Uh, that's part of the theme that, that we incorporated here. Uh, and, 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 and the truth of it is that uh, 
what hurts me the most, uh, and, and as I mentioned this a little while ago, you know, Donald Trump had 69 million people who felt very much like he feels in terms and, and, and the value that he places as a, in communities such as, a, as, such as our own. My hope is not only are we aligned politically with those that are in power, but that those in power begin to invest in, in those communities as they should be investing uh, in communities uh, that help them get elected, number one. And secondly, in investing in communities so that at some point down the line, we're a United States of America and all communities are welcome here. It's that old line that we keep saying again and again and again, your generation, my generation, the generations that are gonna follow, representation exactly. matters. May our politicians, may the community at large finally realize that's not just a cliche, but it should be gospel. Exactly. So, I agree. Thank you so much for this conversation. I want to thank everyone involved uh, here and also all the patients and people who shared their stories with us that you saw earlier. And thank you again for watching this very important discussion. This is the inaugural program. We're going to have more, and we will be producing more in a series as we, as we continue to rebuild again. Hasta la próxima.